So namaste. I've wanted to come to India all my life. This is my bucket list. And so this is my first trip. And it's been awesome. So thank you. I will tell you, Muja Hindi Atihe. Yeah? And those are the only four words I know. <laughs> but it worked with a couple of people at work that got really scared when they thought I knew what they were talking about. <laughs> I do know a few curse words, which I will not share with you today. I hear they're really good ones, though. <laughs> so let's, let's start today with, the, with a few things. A little bit about me. If you're on Twitter, uh, please, please follow me. I am narcissistic. I do enjoy followers. I'll follow you back. I'll put you on a testing list, and then you'll have other thousands of other people who are in, on the Twitter, in the Twitter circuit out there for testing. I've, I've, I need to update this slide. I've done this talk a few times, and I'm at 25 years now, so I'm, I'm a quarter of the way there to that century of, of a career. But I uh, started my career in development. I was, a, I was a developer, thought I was going to do that all of my life. In sixth grade, I said, I'll be a developer. I love this. I'm going to do this. Went to college got a degree, got into, into development. Then I joined the PMO. Anybody work with the PMO? No, me either. I couldn't take it. It wasn't for me. I was too technical. I wanted to be a technical person. And so I, I got out of the PMO after a year. The company I was with, if anyone knows Lowe's Home Improvement in, in the United States. I know some in the back, yeah. But I was there for 20 years, become a development manager, and then I fell in love with testing. I went to a testing conference, and I was a developer at this testing conference, and I really felt out of place, but I also realized I love testing, and I love everything about it. And it was around 2005, and I said, this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my career in IT for sure. I've kind of had experience of doing a lot of things in testing. Uh, the different roles that I've had through the years have really given me a lot of experience in functional testing, automation, performance, service virtualization. And the last two jobs that I've had uh, is just building up and starting organizations. Uh, the, the current one, I got to meet my team here, who is in Bangalore, and uh, four folks that are working with me. I don't usually get that opportunity to meet the folks that are working with me ac across the ocean. So, But it was great to meet the team. Just want to give you a recap of what we're going to do today. I'm not going to talk about automation, even though we're at a Selenium conference, but I know when I talk to the organizers, this is something I think you're really going to enjoy today. We're going to have a lot of fun. This is going to be your fun start to the morning. We're going to talk about no matter how good you are, how good you believe you are as testers, you have to realize there's a possibility of being so familiar with a product that our eyes did not notice the changes. And, and we'll, we'll talk about more of that today. A tips to recognizing patterns and gaps that may, many visual testing activities miss. And then lastly, techniques that you can use to become a, be, a better visual tester. And when we talk about visual testing, there's companies that do visual testing tools. We'll talk about those briefly today. But then we also, and, and this is more about uh, using your vision to find what you need to do as a tester more than actual tools or actually the term visual testing that you've heard in your day-to-day -day work. So tell me this. How many times have you gotten in your car, you, you've drove to work, or you've drove somewhere, and you get there, or you come from work and you go all the way home, and you don't really remember the drive? Anybody do that? Anybody go all the way through a whole drive, and you're like, I don't even remember what I did. I don't even remember where I was. I remember I made it. I made it from point A to B. I didn't have a wreck. Nobody hit me. I didn't hit anyone. I was paying attention, but I wasn't paying attention, really paying attention. And, I've, and I've, I've found myself a lot of times getting all the way home and someone say to me, did you notice that this happened on the side of the road or this is happening at that building or they're building something here? And I'm like, I didn't notice that because I'm zoned in. I'm either using my phone over, over uh, Bluetooth or I'm listening to uh, something on on the radio, and I'm just, I'm kind of, I know I'm driving. It's a routine. It's kind of habitual. And we do that as testers. We get into the situation where we're doing the same thing over and over, and we get so used to it, we stop paying attention to things that are really there in front of us. 
So who can tell me what this says? Do you know? Can you read it? Does it say Michael Owls is jumping to com conclusions? Does it? So your brain filled in those gaps. You thought you knew what it was because you saw the top half of it. And we do that a lot of times. And we, we fall into that situation as testers. I'm going to start my clock. Late. But we fall into that situation as testers. And we, and we see things and we, we fill the gaps. And sometimes it's a good thing. And it helps you to be a, a really good exploratory tester. And sometimes it's a bad thing because you fill the gaps incorrectly. What did that say? New York in the spring? How many thinks it says New York in the spring? Okay, how many does not think it said that? No? Yeah. <laughs> There's two Ds. But your mind skips it because it takes that redundancy on the overlap and it doesn't notice that you're, you're, missing, the, uh, you're missing that extra word in there. And we do it. The, I saw this on a, on a TV show and they were doing this in New York, which I never understand why that it had to be in New York. I mean, you don't have to live in New York to read New York in the spring. Can you tell me what is wrong in this picture? The moon? Okay. Two moons, yes. People try to figure out, you know, what is going on here. There's shadows, you know, or something. But, yeah, he's on the moon, and there's the moon. So it's a, it's a problem. Lots of rumors that this never really happened anyway, but this is definitely not a true story. It's all true. We did never go to the moon. We never went back, so you know, it may be true. <laughs> what do you see here? You see a duck? Or do you see a rabbit? Or do you see both? I should have done that. What was it? Yanny and anybody do the Yanny? I, I should have used that today. There's the there was Yanny and there was some other. Anybody know what I'm talking about? It was like the craze. Yeah. There was a, if you listen to this this recording, um, then you would hear Yanny, and then the, the, the next time you would listen to it, just the frequency to, or the the level of volume you heard, you'd hear another word. So, Laurel, yes, Laurel and Yanny. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Okay. See, it's great. If you Google Laurel and L-O-R-E-L and L-A-U-R-E-L and Yanny, Y-A-N-N-Y, you'll find the, the sound clip. And if you listen to it, you'll hear them both. And you'll think, I don't, I don't hear but one. But you'll go back a, a few minutes later, you'll hear the other. And then sometimes you can hear them both if you're weird like me. What do you see here? Is this the good guy or the bad guy? Is there a mean face or a happy face? Mean? Happy? Or at least somewhat pleasant? Maybe not too happy? <laughs> now squint your eyes. Everybody squint. I meant to take a picture when everybody did this. But squint your eyes really close and see what you see now. If you squint, if you squint where you can barely see it, this one will go to normal and this one will go to the moon. Anybody see that? Everybody see that? So it's weird. I use this as an example of sometimes it's it, you have to step back and take a different look at what you're testing and, and what you're doing with your uh, your test plan to figure out how to see things that maybe you didn't see when you looked at it the first time or looked at it directly. So let me tell you a little bit about myself. Okay, seriously, that's a joke. And I'm not that narcissistic that I'm showing you this again. But did anybody notice something in my profile? My name isn't. My name isn't Michael. <laughs> I've done this presentation a few times, and, and I've, I've had one person in the whole, in the whole, all the times I've done it, that stopped me on the first slide and said, wait, 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 why does that say isn't? You know, I usually don't catch that, but good for you guys. So context is king, definitely. How, how many people work in a shop that does context-driven testing? No? One person in the whole room. Oh, okay, okay. 
Anyone know what I'm talking about when I say rapid software testing? No? Okay, one. Anybody know James Bach? See me after this presentation. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you change your world. <laughs> and, and, and if you're just against it, but I don't think you will be because I, I, I've been fortunate to work in, in shops that do requirements-based testing and you take the requirements and you write the test cases and you execute those steps and you complete the work. But in a context-driven shop, it's more about understanding the, ap the application, becoming familiar with what is the context of what we're testing. And my testers love it here in Bangalore because they can, they don't have to write test cases. Now, they realized after they got on board with me that there's still a lot of work to do because they do mind maps. Anybody do mind maps in your organization? Love mind maps. Look for xmind.net if you're not using them. It's free to download, xmind.net, and it's beautiful. And it'll change your world if you can do your requirements and, and look at your systems by doing mind maps. And that's what I focus on in, in, in a context-driven world is that is what we use is kind of defining how we're going to do testing is by doing the mind maps and then, and then taking it down a, another level and, and becoming very familiar with the application. And what that does for our testers when you're doing context-driven testing is it makes them more visual testers. They start seeing things. You know, if you, if you take a requirement, here's your 10 requirements, and I write my test scripts. I, they're focused. There are these 10 steps, and I'm going to do these things. But if you, if you look at context-driven, I'm trying to figure out everything I can about the application, and I don't really care what the new changes were or what the requirements. I want to, I want to make sure the requirements were met and the product is right, but I want to make sure that the overall enterprise-level product that I'm delivering to the client is exactly what, what they wanted or the stakeholders. Now, John Lubbock says what we see depends mainly on what we look for. If you've ever said, I'm looking for a new car, and I would like to have a red car, and this model of the red car. How many have done this, and you go out and you say, I want that car, and then all of a sudden, everywhere you look, you see that red car or that model of that car? And you're like, I didn't see those before, but now that I'm paying attention to this one type of car that I want, or this one bike that I want, or this one bicycle that I want, then all of a sudden, now you see them everywhere. And I try to do that when I'm trying to buy a new car because I want to make sure mine is special. You know, I want to have that one car when people see it. That's him. I know who that is. I don't always get that lucky. I usually end up with a car that everybody has. <laughs> and what are you looking for here? What do you see? Shadows. Good job. See, you're learning. By the end of this, you're going to be teaching this class. But a lot of people don't notice. There's, these are not camels. They are camels, but what you see, what you think is camels is right here along the, so it's an aerial view, a top view of shadows. And don't always trust what you see. I, I, anybody ever had this situation where you put salt on something and you thought it was sugar? You ever put salt in coffee? Horrible. Makes it even worse. <laughs> Make that mistake. You only do it once. But you need to be able to, to, um, to make sure you, do, you don't always trust what you see. Salt, always, salt will look like sugar until you taste it. Then you can tell. Once you get further deep into the details, then you can tell. Notice here, sometimes we get so narrow in our vision and what we're doing, we see, we see things that are not really there, or we see the wrong thing until we step back and be able to see the whole picture. Some of the words of the day that we're going to use today, we're going to talk about is inattentional blindness. This goes back to when you, when you leave for home or you leave for work and you don't pay attention to things, that's inattentional blindness. And you, you're, you're not really blind, of course, but you're not catching things that are just right in front of your face. Uh, anamorphic art, uh, bistable images, choice blindness. We're going to talk about neuroplasticity. You didn't know you were going to have a medical course today, right? And then change blindness as well. Before we really start talking about visual testing and vision, we've got to start where, where it all begins, and that is with the brain. And the human brain, the one thing I thought was interesting when you start looking at the brain and how the brain works, the part that actually does vision is in the very back. 
furthest away from your eyes. I don't know why that was designed, why we were designed that way and why that happened, but it, it does seem the furthest away. It has to go through a lot of, your eyes are up here and, and, and what does your actual vision is in the back. One thing with the brain is, just a few minutes ago we saw that. If, if, if you tell your brain it has comparisons to make, decisions to make, it'll start filling those gaps every single time. If you look at it, um, when you saw half my name, Mike Lyles is jumping to conclusions, and you said, I think that's what that means, because your brain was already filling in those gaps and trying to decide you know, what, what needs to be there, because I can't see this, so my, your brain will take over and do that for you. And a lot of times your brain will sacrifice facts over efficiency, uh, just pure facts. Once, you, once they, you believe that this is the truth, you'll, you'll go with that. And we'll take mental shortcuts. We do it all the time. Same thing with, with how we test sometimes. We'll say, I think I know how this should work, so I'm going to do this without really investigating maybe some of the things you should be doing um, to, to make, the, make sure the product is, is ready to go. Now, can you read this? It's pretty easy, right? Yeah? You can go all the way through it. I, I, I highlighted strange because it was the one that messed me. It usually, I couldn't get my, I don't know why. Maybe I'm strange, I don't know. But you can go through this whole thing. And the only thing that researchers have found is as long as you have the first letter and the last letter, as long as there's some context to the story, or the word, you can fill in the gaps. Your brain does the work. I bet you didn't even know you could do this, right? Now you can go home and say, I don't really have to read real words. I can guess, figure out a whole paragraph in front of 60, 70 people. One thing is for sure is the brain is a survival organ. Uh, it's designed to solve problems related to surviving in unstable environments. And even though we may not be the most strongest animals in the world, our, our brains are definitely the most developed, and we know that. I mean, I've, I've had some dogs that I think think as smart as I do. But they, they've tried to outsmart me for sure. The one I have right now does a really good job of um, outsmarting me. I'm going to go off on a tangent and tell you this story. I locked him out of my house the other day because I was working, and I won't tell the reasons I locked him out. You can ask me afterwards, but he was carrying up my house. And so I put him in my backyard and I just let him out there and I was working at home. And a few minutes later I heard something at my door. He had figured out a way to jump up, pull the door handle and come in the house. He's never done that before. And so now I have to lock the door when I send him outside. <laughs> but animals do get pretty smart. So now what, what age do you think that the brain stops growing? Because we're growing, you know, we get to a certain size. I'm hoping that both my brain and my everything stops growing as much as it has been through the years. But what, what age do you think the brain stops growing? Never? Okay. We're, we're close to fully developed, probably in the 20s, but, but you're right, it never stops growing. You, know, you can exercise. It's the same reason we go to the gym every, every you know, some of us go to the gym every day or every week. And, and spend time there is because if you keep exercising, it keeps you fit. If you keep your brain exercised, then you stay fit there as well. Every brain is wired differently. So I'll go through a couple of things on the brain here. It's, it, was, um, it was believed that, they, that, that the brain slowed growth at 20 and stopped growing at 40. But that's, that's been proven not true, as, as you guys agree as well. And what you do in learning life, as you, as you go through life, you'll learn as you go, and it kind of builds. A lot of things I've learned, um, I remember Steve Jobs saying we connect the dots backwards, not forwards. We know things that, that happen to us. Uh, we don't realize those things are happening, and, and then fate kind of helps us drive what we're doing. Same things with our brains. We grow along the way, and what we learn today may help us be better tomorrow and the next day and the next week. Kids, you see different kids. If you go to a school, you'll see some tall kids, short kids, you know, big kids, small kids. Same thing with brains. Their their brains develop the same way. Um, so, don't don't tell your family members your brains better if, unless you believe that. You know, if you believe it, that's okay. 
Now, here's the thing I think that a lot of people are surprised about, and is that we avoid boredom by multitasking. Anybody multitask here every day at work? I try it. Um, I, t I try to work on slides sometimes and watch TV and end up watching TV, and I can't, I can't do that. Uh, your brain is incapable. I, I, there's research that has been done that there's like 2% of the people on the whole planet that are called super taskers, and they can do it, and they can do it very efficiently. Uh, I would say out of this room, maybe one of you, you know, you know who you are. You can do really good multitasking. Anybody? Okay. Uh, but it's most of us, probably not the case. Probably 98% to 100% of this room, we're not very good if we try to multitask. Uh, we try to juggle emails, phone, tablets, social networks, um, and your error rate, proven, goes goes down. I mean, goes up 50% when you're trying to do multiple things at the same time. As testers, that's a challenge for us because when we have to do multiple things at the same time, uh, we we kind of get in that situation where we might have some errors in the way that we're testing because we're trying to test or cover three three or four things at the same time. Speaking of boring things, can you tell me what's so unusual about this paragraph? No? It is really hard to find. So when you see it, you won't be able to not see it. What is that? No commas? No, it's just because somebody typed it up bad. <laughs> no guesses. And when I tell you, it's going to be so easily visible in front of you. There's no ease in this whole paragraph. Now I bet you can take it. Last line? Okay, maybe it's X's. Where do you see E's? No E. E. See, you almost made me doubt my own presentation. That's it. Here. <laughs> no E's. There's no X's either. We don't usually look for X's in paragraphs, right? <laughs> right, right. They're just unusual. Anybody see it and was just afraid to say you saw no E's? Come on. One. Yeah. You didn't see E's? <laughs> yeah. All right. Anybody seen the color card changing trick? You have? Okay. Don't tell anybody that. I'm going to play this for you. Hi, I'm Richard, this is Sarah, and we're going to perform the amazing colour-changing card trick with this blue-backed deck of cards. Now the idea is very simple. I'm just going to spread the cards in front of Sarah and ask her to push any card towards the camera. Right, okay, let's see. I'm going to go for this card here. Okay. Now Sarah could have selected any card at all from the deck, but she selected the card which is now face down on the table. And what I'm going to ask her to do is show us which card she selected. Right, so the card that I chose was in fact the Three of Diamonds. The Three of Diamonds, okay, an excellent choice. That card goes back into the deck. Now I'm just going to spread the cards face up on the table. Do a little click of the fingers. And you'll see that Sarah's card here has now got a blue back. Not particularly surprising. What's slightly more surprising is all of the other cards have got red backs. And that is the amazing color changing card trick. Now, did you see what happened? They changed the deck? How did they do that? Slight advance? I love magic with, with, with cards. But now, pay close, what's that? Yes, you're seeing it. Anybody else see her dress change? 
No? Good eye. Good eye. Now what? This is not about the cards. <laughs> but notice this. So now watch what they do when they Hi, take I'm Richard. This is Sarah. And we're going to perform the amazing color-changing card trick with this blue-backed deck of cards. Now the idea is very simple. I'm just going to spread the cards in front of Sarah and ask her to push any card towards the camera. Right, okay, let's see. I'm going to go for this card here. Okay. Now Sarah could have selected any card at all from the deck, but she selected the card which is now face down on the table. And what I'm going to ask her to do is show us which card she selected. Right, so the card that I chose was in fact the Three of Diamonds. The Three of Diamonds, okay, excellent choice. That card goes back into the deck. Now I'm just going to spread the cards face up on the table. Do a little click of the fingers, and you'll see that Sarah's card here has now got a blue back. Not particularly surprising. What's slightly more surprising is all of the other cards have got red backs. And that is the amazing colour-changing card trick. So, <laughs> did you notice there was a gorilla in this picture that, okay, see, now you're starting to pay attention. I don't know what they used the gorilla for. I think they just wanted to say at the end of this, oh, by the way, we also got your game with this gorilla. But now I'm going to play another one for you, which is very similar, but I bet you're getting really better now, because now you know the game, right? You know what's happening to you. Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. Why, I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. Well, but, but how did you know? Madam, as any horticulturist will tell you, one does not plant petunias until May is out. Take her away. It's just a matter of observation. The real question is how observant were you? 21 changes. Did you catch them? Uh, action. Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. So, interesting, there are several of these out there that you can find on YouTube or wherever you go. Anyone ever walk through a corn maze? You have corn... Uh, I, I'm, I'm an idiot, so I don't know if India has, like, cornfields, and, and do you have cornfields in a lot of... Have cornfields, but you've never gone through a corn maze. Anyone go through a corn maze? It's terrifying a little bit because I'm claustrophobic. You know, if I'm in an elevator and the doors sit there, this one here does this to me. It gets to the ground floor and it sits there for a minute. I'm like, please, just open. I'm gonna, I'm gonna start kicking the wall. But corn mazes do that to me as well. I get a little claustrophobic because you get inside of a corn maze. And, and it's great because if you've done, if you've done mazes when you were a kid and you, you mapped them out, it was. You know, you looked at things like this, and you see the aerial view. It's easy to tell how I can get through this corn maze. But my kids love to do corn mazes. I've taken to, them to a couple. And the last one I went to, they gave, they gave us a map. So they said, you won't get lost. I mean, it's a huge maze. It was probably as complicated as this one. And you start in. I mean, these are buildings here, giant buildings. So you come in here, and then you try to make it to the end. 
when you come out the other end. And so my son and I, we're going through, and we're reading the map. We're following the map. We know exactly where we're. Okay, I can tell I'm here, so I need to turn left and turn right. And we got through this thing in just like 20 minutes. And, and then we realized it wasn't that exciting when we didn't explore the rest of, you know, we had all these, we basically went like right up through here and we were done. You know, and we're like, hey, we did it. I, I don't know. I think we thought we were going to get a trophy at the end of this, you know, where they were going to say, congratulations, you did it in 20 minutes. Nobody's ever done it that fast. But when we got through, we said, okay, let's back up and now let's backtrack and, and try to explore the whole thing. So we didn't even spend another hour. Um, my daughter wasn't as happy about that, but we spent an hour going through everything with, with my son. And here's kind of the view. If you've never been in a corn maze, so you see this from the top, and this looks pretty easy. Hey, I know, I know which way I can go, but when you're down in the corn, this is what you see. And so you get to the end here. It's kind of hard to see kind of the view of the way the map should look because you're walking in the middle of this corn that's taller than you are. So my... What it, what it tells me when, it, when I use this corn, corn maze uh, scenario is that, you know, using the map takes away your creativity. Uh, I wanted the map. I wanted to have that backup so that if we did get lost, we could kind of figure out where we were, even though they really didn't tell you where you were along the way. So it's kind of like you would have had to figure it out anyway. And you might get through quickly, but you, go, you don't get to explore the whole field. A lot of times we test quickly. Been in that situation where someone says, I need this done in three days. Please get it back to me. Let's get it out the door. Um, we've developed it forever. Now we'd like you to test it for two days. Um, and, and, and you get in that situation, and, and we try to do it fast. And there's, there's creative ways to be fast to make sure you get the high-risk things and the, and the high probability of failure tested. But it's always good to have more time in your testing plan as well. And, and the last, you may miss some interesting, important parts of the maze. You just try to find the fastest path out. I challenge my testers on my team to be the one that finds that one bug that makes the, the project team go, how in the world did you find this? You know, how did you, how did you find this problem? And, and they do take that as a challenge. Every time we test something, it's always nobody would have, you know, lots of times our developers will say, nobody's ever going to do that. And we're like, well, it doesn't matter if they're going to do that or not. Uh, we were able to do it and able to break it. Or find it broken. We didn't break it. We starve for relevance. It is a proven fact. Studies have shown that we got to do something every 10 minutes to reset our attention. So in this 90 minutes, I've got to keep you at least entertained every nine uh, nine times today. So and we'll try to do that. So that every every 10 minutes, uh, we'll wake you back up if if I lose you. But it, it is important to stay relevant. And what I, what I try to tell with this story is that when, you're, when you do start for relevance and you miss out after 10 minutes, and, and if you don't get that 10-minute awakening when you're testing, a lot of times we get into that inattentional blindness and we start missing things that, um, that, we, that we should be seeing, but we're getting such into a routine that we miss it. And, it just, and later on you look back and say, oh, I should have seen that. I should have caught that. Do you know that stressed brains don't learn the same way? Lots of times being stressed, um, our brains are wired to deal with, with stress um, lasting less than or equal to 30 seconds. Anything more than that, we start unwiring ourselves. So I'm not sure if I can handle even 30 seconds of it, but you may feel the same. There's an old saying, whether the, whether the lion eats you or you get away, the stress lasts only a few minutes. So what's, what things stress or distract you at work? What things keep you from being productive in what you do every day as, as a tester? You can tell me. I won't tell your boss. My folks usually tell me it's you. You're the one that stresses us because you tell us, do this, do this. There are things that stress, stress us out. This slide bothers a lot of people, has over the years. Because of the hallucination and the amnesia, people fear, fear that, that this is really true. What am I going to do? My work gets really, really tough. Things get really, really uh, difficult and stressful. Am I going to start having hallucinations? Uh, am I going to have amnesia? I think I have amnesia sometimes when I'm working. <laughs> Not real. 
Now, we have a lot of people here, but I want to do one thing. Anybody play Perfection? Anybody know that game? No? Yes? How many of you know that game? Just a few. All right. Now, usually I've done this, I've done this as a workshop, and we have a, a smaller group, but I want to do this today. Um, I just need two volunteers. We have two volunteers that are brave to, to play a game that my 10-year-old daughter plays really well. Anyone? Okay. Who was it? You? And who else? Uh, first to stand up. Come on up. Yes, come on. All right. Now, this is a game. Okay, I'm going to show it to the camera. I'm on TV, and I act differently when I'm on TV. You know, I use my right side of my face. All right, so we will we'll do this because I, I don't know if everyone will be able to see it. I wish I had, was able to put this up. We can't put this up on the screen, can we? We can't put this up on the screen from there. And it's okay. I didn't tell you that before. And, then, and, and we really don't. We don't have to. Right, if, and you folks can probably stand and see it. We'll, we'll put it on this table, okay? So who wants to go first? You go first? Okay. You have to leave. And go. <laughs> no, you just uh, step outside the door, do not listen to anything, I'll come get you. Okay? You're going to be the second contestant. You're going to be first. You, if folks can come around. I know it'll be a big crowd. We're going to see, what's your name? Sadita. Sadita? Okay. You're going to be the first contestant on perfection. Yeah. <laughs> gone, right? Okay. <laughs> now I'm going to tell you, my 10-year-old is really good at this. Now, I will tell you this thing throws these everywhere when it gets to 60 seconds. You have 60 seconds to get these into this. And my daughter does it in about 40. Okay? <laughs> and, and she's 10. She's 10. Okay, go. <laughs> You're halfway there. Yeah. Fifteen seconds. This is not going well. <laughs> okay. Everybody, everybody give a big hand. Big hand. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, so turn me off just for a second. So we're going to bring me out. I need, I need like a couple of volunteers who like to play games on people. Uh, practical jokes. Okay. Like four or five of you. Okay. I want you to, and we come in and start. I want you to be talking, getting in his face. You know, don't don't hit him, don't <laughs> don't push him. But yeah, so yeah. Somebody turn on somebody turn on your phone, and play music. You know, do something like that. So we'll bring him in. Now, what's what I'm going to do to him? Okay. What was his name? You can turn me on that. Okay. What is your name? Raj. Raj. Raj, ladies and gentlemen, Raj. Okay, Raj. So the object of this game is for you to, you got 60 seconds to get all of these into this, okay? Okay? She did it in 45, okay? My daughter can do it in 40. She's 10, okay? <laughs> Go. Oh, wait, push it down, push it down, push it down. <laughs> that is a bug with this thing. <laughs> it's something wrong with. Hold on, hold on. I'm going to give you one more chance. Don't push the blue. There is a defect. I'm sending this back. 
All right, go. The game is screwing up my, my concept here. See, he's been through this. <laughs> Halfway there. This is a bug. Keep going. It is breaking. What have you done to this thing? This worked on my machine. <laughs> I'm helping you now because I... That's not the right place. But you are running out of time. I've got two of these at home. I should have brought the other one. I'll give you a few seconds. A few more? <laughs> You're already way further than she was. Yeah. yeah. Oh, look, at that's nice. See, she knows how to do this because she's done it already. I'm so sorry, Raj. This is it. It's the final one. Oh, good. All right, give him a big hand. He did his best. Okay. We just want to do this the rest of the day? Okay. And go home and buy it. You can get this uh, on eBay. In some stores. <laughs> but I realized here that this thing, I think traveling with this thing, I've broken the the latch. It should not come up like that. Sorry. I introduced new defects to your process. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it was kind of cool that it worked that way, but no, I, that was not intentional. <laughs> so, so what does this tell us? Now, I've done this before, and I, have, and I always have to wait to see, because I've done this before, and the second person comes in, and you tell them that they did it in 40 seconds. I had a pretty good feeling that, that Raj may have been able to do it if it hadn't have been jumping up and down on him and, 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 and he would have been able to do it. Just because he thought somebody else could do it made him do it. And, and when, when you tried it first, you had no idea if anybody else had done it this way before. So a lot of times working together, helping other people figure out, here's what I did, here's how I solved the problem, learning what other people have done in, in testing or, or even development kind of helps us out. A lot of times in our, in our test reports that we do in my company, we always want to know what are the existing problems that we've already faced so we can look for those things again if we've had problems in the past with an application. Um, some people will perform better if they think someone else performed well. And distractions will slow down some of us, but what I find is some people handle distractions really well. And, they, and you can be right in their face. I've had people put music in people's face. I mean, right in their face, you're going to get this, you're going to get this. And some people get in the zone, and they do really well there. Now, we talk about vision. This, this whole course today is about visual testing. But there's other senses that we should look at as well. Um, reading, hearing, seeing only. And you combine hearing and seeing, it, it increases. We're going to talk about that in a moment. But smell is usually effective, is unusually effective at provoking memories. And I think about my grandmother, who's been gone for almost 20 years now, but I, I can smell an apple pie and think of my grandmother. Just the moment I smell it, I think about her apple pies. And then our minds take us back to things. Lots of times we have sensories in our, you know, it, it brings back things to our minds when we smell certain things or, or hear certain things. Vision trumps all other senses. Sorry that I'm American talking about trumps anything. So <laughs> it goes over really well in America every time I say that. But children's books have a lot of pictures in them. And we retain memory by hearing things 10%. But if you add pictures and you put pictures to a, to a book, you know, a lot of times you notice children's books usually don't have a whole lot of words. They have a lot of pictures. And kids remember the story even though they may not even be able to read it. But it, it, it increases by 65% when you have pictures included. I need two more volunteers, victims. Everybody raise your hand. This is going to be really fun. This is a lot easier than that. <laughs> Give me two. All right, you and... Oh, where? Oh, yes. Come on up. 
Which of you is a better reader? Are you a good reader? How fast can you read? Come on up. Come on up. We'll put you on camera. Welcome to YouTube. You're a really good reader? I'm a really how good reader. How many, bo how many bo books did you read this year? Uh, one in the last three years. Oh, that's, that sounds about like me. How about you? What's your name? Jesseline Sahib. Jesseline, nice to meet you. And? Mohan. Mohan and Jesseline, give them a big hand. How many books have you read? One. Okay. No books. Okay. I'm going to give him the easier one. All right. Since you've read at least one. All right, you come over here. You stay here. Don't look at him. You get this. You get this. I'm going to give you 30 seconds to read this story. No. No, 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 because he doesn't want to hear what you're saying. Read it all. Now, I'm going to give you a test afterwards. I've got 10 questions to ask you. Okay? Take it in. Remember what you're reading. The intensity is building. You're serious. You guys haven't read a lot lately, right? <laughs> Come on, man. It's only like two paragraphs. Okay. <laughs> I'm joking. Ready? I'm letting Jocelyn decide when we're done. When he says he's done. You done? Okay. Take your paper. Are you done? Okay. Thank you. All right. Now, it's a competition. All right? Come closer. Get on TV. Together. Smile. Okay. All right, here we go. One of you hold this. Now, you get to decide who, who answers the question. What was the boy's name? You raise your hand or take your vote, okay? Don Cheese. Don Cheese. Did you know this? Okay. How old is he? Raise your hand. First one to raise your hand. 13. 13. Where did he go to school? He went on a green bus, yes. Do you know what school was? Did you know green bus? Yes, okay. So he's got green bus. He's got one, you got three. <laughs> okay, who knows what three cities he lived in? Okay. Um, Paris, Agra, and New York. Yes. You knew this? You remember this? <laughs> Race faster than him, man. Yeah, Come on. <laughs> okay. Uh, what did he see first when he went out? And it was and it was waiting, it was on the bus. Okay. No, that wasn't what he saw first. Don't give him the answers for the next question. <laughs> what did he see first? A yellow unicorn. Yes. You didn't see a yellow unicorn? Seriously. He's killing you. He is killing you now. All right, okay. Then what did he see next after that? Okay. Tractor. Tractor? What color was that tractor? What color was the tractor? You forgot to? No, you're killing me, man. <laughs> what was driving the tractor? Wolf. Okay, so you both need a wolf. Okay. Now, what was on the trailer? There were multiple things on the trailer. Grand piano. Grand piano? Did you know grand piano? Okay. It's okay not to remember. You have the harder part, I think. Then you said tanker. Oh, okay. So you didn't read the other ones? You need to see it again? No, okay. All right, so I would say he beat you on this. Uh, he, you, that one book in two years really helped you out because you read a lot better, more detailed. But give them both a big hand. I really appreciate you both for volunteering. And I'll explain why I put you on the spot. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so now, Jasmine was at um, Jas Jasmine. Okay, sorry, let me call you Jasmine. I'm an idiot. He was at a little bit of an advantage because this is what his, his, his 
is opposite the other guy. What's your name? Mohan. Mohan. Mohan was at a disadvantage because this is what he read, okay? And Jasmine saw this, okay? So he saw all the pictures. He remembered the pictures. He remembered what he was reading. So it kind of gave him an advantage to remember. Uh, the, I tried this for the first time, put the 13 in a big letter, because neither people usually get 13 by just having 13 in the story. And, and it worked. Thank you. The test passed. <laughs> but there's a lot to be learned from this. A lot of times you can have, uh, a lot of times it's easier uh, as a tester to be able to give, give back to the organization exactly what you saw. Trying to explain to a developer what you saw without showing them screenshots and reproducing that for them sometimes doesn't give them the advantage they need to uh, to go and find the solution. My testers a lot of times want to help the developers, which the developers don't want their help sometimes. You know, you ever been in that situation? I don't need your help. Just stay back. But you know where natural born explorers? My 10-year-old daughter says to me, Dad, I'm never going to be a tester. Now, she wears every shirt that I take home, uh, the Sauce Lab shirts and all the other shirts that I take home. She wears them all the time, the T-shirts, but she says, Dad, I'm never going to be a tester. And I said, unfortunately, you started out as a tester, as a baby, trying to put everything in your mouth that you could touch, whether it was food or not food, jumping off the back of our couch at two years old, and, and she explored. And my son was a little less wild as my daughter, um, and he's, he's older than her. But, but babies learn by exploring. You know, sometimes in, in, in difficult situations as parents, if you've been in that situation as a parent, you know that babies love to explore, and that's why we have the childproof door handles and gates and everything else to, to keep them from going and doing things that we don't want them to do. Um, but I think we need to... Uh, if you've got a, a, a kid and they want to ask questions, let them ask all the questions they want. Mine love to play the why game in the back of my car. Dad, why are we doing this? And, well, because we need to do this today. Why? And then you answer the question, then it's why. And they just keep asking why until you reach back and say, please stop asking me so many questions. But good tester, testers learn how to experiment like babies. Um, I, did, I, did a, I did a workshop in California USA uh, two months ago called Testing Like a Kid. We played games. We did things. I had videos of kids that have, that have tested things. I had young children uh, doing things and testing things. And then I had people from the class do the same thing. And what I found was uh, we sometimes get ruined by growing up sometimes. And uh, just as with many things in life, we, we allow our what we learn along the way in life. There's good, there's good things you can learn and get better, and then there's things that you kind of learn that become bad habits. And uh, kids don't usually have barriers when they're test. They make great exploratory testers. And um, anytime I, I want to test an app for my company, a lot of times I can, I can try with my kids, and they, they find things even I can't find just because they try things you don't even think of, including breaking the iPad, which literally breaking it, which is not very... Uh, Cost effective. <laughs> Another video for you. Let's try this one. See what you get. Think fast. Check your head. You have 10 seconds to answer. Do you know? 87? Hit pause if you're good. stuck. Yes, it is 87. It's turned upside down. Um, everybody get it? Is 87? No? I'll, I'll take you back to this really quick. I'm sorry. So you can see. It was 87 because... Think back. It was upside down. Sometimes it's good to see. You, anyone seen the cartoon where the testers on one side, the developers on the other? And there's a six on the table, and the developers going, "I see nine, and the tester says, "I see six. Sometimes you gotta, you've got to define those different views uh, that people have. Now, which way is this bus going? Ah, that's a good question. 
See, this is the first time I've done this in India, which is totally a different answer than I, than I got in America the last time I did this. You know where that's going. Kids will get this every single time. Another situation of not being ruined by growing up. You know which way it's going for sure? Right? It's parked. <laughs> that's, I'm going to use that. That's a great answer. <laughs> no, uh, it depends on where you are. Kids will tell you because they know, kids know that the door opens to the curb. So if I'm in the U.S., the, the, the bus is going to the left because we're on the right side of the road and the door is going to open on the right side. So this bus is going this way. But if you're here, you, you drive on the left side of the road and the bus is going to be on the left side and the door is going to be on the, the left. Correct? It could be reversing, yes. That could be going backwards. That's another good idea. Two good things I'm adding that. I'll get your names afterwards. <laughs> Nobody's ever said that. Great job. <laughs> Design of everyday things. A lot of things are designed to be the same way. I mean, you go into your, you go into your hotel room today. As soon as you go in there, there's, there's lights, right? Um, I, I, I learned in Australia how to handle using the lights in India. I, I, was, I was experienced after I spoke in Australia last year, but not being a world traveler until last year, I didn't know. I spent, I spent about 20 minutes in a hotel in Australia at a conference I was speaking at, trying to figure out how to get the lights to come on, and then I realized you put your card in the, in the door. We don't do that in America. You know, We just go in and flip the switch. But even then, the switches are right at the door. And so most of the time, things are designed that way. Things are designed the right way. And I used to use the example of the controller. Controllers are always going to have the, the power at the top left. And then I was at a conference doing this very presentation, and this is the controller I had, and the power was down here. So, but I think they did it on purpose because the order button for ordering movies was up here now. So it's like, hey, if we change the design, it helps us. And now he's ordering stuff without knowing it. So, may see gas pumps like this. Gas pumps with debit, yes or no, credit. And usually you see an arrow here to one of these buttons on the, on the gas pump. And I usually see that, so you'll say uh, there'll be a yes here with dots and then a no here with dots. And I was at this gas pump. This is a real-life picture right off my phone where there was nothing. So as a tester, I pushed all, all eight of them. You know, I, start, I start on the one I thought would be no, which would usually over here is the way they usually do them in the U.S., probably here too. But then I just started going through all of them, and none of them worked. And then I realized below that was the touchpad that says yes and no. Nobody told me. No, nobody told me. Change blindness. I do this every time. I always think there's no way I can talk for an hour and a half on something, and then I'm realizing, man, i got to hurry to get you guys through this today. Have you heard of change blindness? We see things that slightly change, and we don't realize it. So when you, an interesting way to do it, a lot of people that look for change blindness is they look at a picture and then you flash back and right, back and forth, then you can see what changed in the picture. And this one is pretty evident, but there's a lot of tools and a lot of ways that you can test to find out what has changed from one, one uh, scenario, one picture to the other. I'm going to try to be fast with this because we got about 30 minutes left. And I got about 72 this slides. This video together. shows a participant from I don't the have 1998 study by Daniel Simons and Daniel <laughs> Levin. Watch what happens as the unsuspecting pedestrian provides directions. I want you to think about whether you would have this situation happen to you. The young man on the left is one of the experimenters. He has approached the white haired man and asked for directions. Watch closely as two people carrying a door pass between them, and the first experimenter is replaced by someone else. <laughs> and he didn't notice. You think he would have noticed? I saw that, I saw that. Like many of the people in this study, the pedestrian was entirely unaware that he was talking to a different person. <laughs> now they go on to show that they even do it, they went, they got brave and they started changing it from a male to a female and the guy still didn't even realize it. People are so focused on helping you, figuring out what's on your map, telling you directions. They don't even catch it going from male to female. Anyone use eBay through the years? Probably not as much as we used to. eBay? Sorry, familiar? 
You know what color it was? Do you remember when it was this color? Yellow, everywhere. So now what eBay did was one day eBay said, well, everybody's using white now. Google's great. It's all white. There's, a, there's other sites that are using all white. We want to go all white as well. We want to have an all white eBay screen. The background, the UI was going to be white. They went overnight and changed it to all white. And people lost their mind because of that. They could not take it that they had changed the color. I mean, people were mad saying, I'll never shop on eBay again. You know, they were going on TV shows. It was crazy. There were, people were very irritated and upset that eBay had changed its colors from yellow to white. So eBay said, okay, 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 sorry, 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 sir. Yellow again. They went back to yellow. And then every week for a year, they lightened it just a little bit, just a little bit from yellow to less yellow to less yellow to, to white. And then nobody complained because the people didn't catch the slight changes along the way, and eventually it was fine. No more problem. Crazy, right? I, when, I, when I heard this story, I, I didn't even know that eBay had gone to apply. I had to go check it myself to see it. I thought I would have, you would have asked me what color, and I would have bet thousands on it that it was still yellow. And I just did I wouldn't have known it. I wasn't one of those upset either. I, I can take any color on a web page as long as I can buy something. Now, I'm going to be able to tell which card you pick. You pick the one you want, any one of the five. Keep your eye on it. I'm going to make your card disappear. Okay? Did it? Yes? All of them changed, yeah. We kept the color. We just changed the suits. A lot of people get fooled by that. Kids really get fooled by it. I love doing it to kids. Anybody a kid here? I'm just kidding. We see faces and everything. I've been doing this with shoes for all my life, taking pictures Drive my mother crazy with my shoes. You know, if you put your phone up to this right now, it will it will fit, it will start boxing this as if it's a person. It sees that as a person, and studies show that kids do not like to see that. If you if you show this picture to a baby, they'll start crying. If you have a baby, don't do that. <laughs> but I did, <laughs> and it does work. The babies do not like to see that. It bothers them. They like to see this. Now, I use this in the U.S. You probably notice some of these folks, but even with distortion, you can tell who people are, even though you're not really seeing the picture. Like this guy. Anybody know this guy? Clinton. How about this guy? Yes. There's some others. You may may not know this guy. Yep. And this guy. Yep. And then how about this guy? Yep. And then this guy. So see, your mind fills the gaps. You fill the gaps. You know, you, you don't see the real picture, but you're able to know what that real picture is by seeing it. We do that a lot. We need to do that as testers. Now, who is this? Anything wrong with this picture? Yeah? That's how he looks now. <laughs> After all that's going on. Now, keep your eye on this dot right here. Close attention. Yeah, now watch this. Now, don't, I mean, just kind of notice things out of the sides of your, you know, out of the corner of your eyes, but keep your eye on the, X, the, the plus in the middle. You noticing something? The faces look like monsters. And then when you look, if you look really quick, the monster goes away. Weird, odd, I don't know. They, uh, there's a cognitive scientist I put here, Matthew Thompson. He did this, and he says that they haven't figured out why it does that. But you, your, your mind's focused on the, the, the plus. You'll see all kinds of crazy things. And there's nothing wrong with the pictures, but you're, you're, it's changing. So you see two different people with two different face types. Um, it's, 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 a, it's a phenomenon. You know what these are? It's not a trick. Yeah? Yeah? Yes. Now, there's a, there's a Canadian psychologist who talks about pattern recognition. And he talks about how that once we realize what something is, we kind of know what it is. Once you've seen a dog, you pretty much know what a dog is. 
that gets us in trouble with testers a lot of the times because once we've seen this certain situation, we think, well, that's the way it's going to work every time. And don't, don't, don't fall into that because even though you can tell what something is here, pattern recognition is good at times, but a lot of times it will get you in trouble as well. Did you know your eyes have defects? Everybody's eyes have defects. And your eyes try to make up for it. If you'll stare at that red dot, blinking dot in the middle, keep your eye on it, eventually one, two, or all three of those other dots will go away. You notice that? Your eye sees that. I put it in my notes because I'm not that good at remembering all this stuff. But there are micro saccades. Uh, when, when your eyes are fixated about twice a second, they make movements called micro saccades that are too small to be noticed. Your eyes move at most one-third of a degree. When you perceive the flow, the micro saccades rate is increased. And so what happens is your eyes start making up for this and saying, I don't supposed to see that, and it starts mapping them out. Don't stare too long at your screen when you're testing. <laughs> it is going away. How about this one? Same thing here. Everything on this whole board will go away. You'll just see a wooden board in a minute if you stare long enough. I'll give you a second to do that. Good. Everything disappeared. We're ready to go home now. All clean. Okay, none of us are as good as all of us. I want you to look at this. This is a gumball. Back, nothing, there's no tricks. I don't have anything packed in there other than gumballs. This thing has been all over the world. And it's been stopped by every airport uh, person wanting to know why I've got this many gumballs in my bag. Uh, the New York TSA stopped me and actually wanted to taste them. I don't know why she was that brave, but she really did that. <laughs> Have people with me to witness that that, that happened. But I want you to tell me how many gumballs are in this container. And I'll come around and I'll let you look. You can guess. See, kind of kind of take a guess. Think about how many you, you think are. Oh, wait, don't tell me yet. I've got to write them down. 500. 1,500. See, they're still doing it. All right. I'm going to write these numbers down, so this way, this way. Keep your numbers secret. Nobody say one. Anybody from the U.S. know the price is right? We don't play the price is right here. You can't say one. <laughs> you good? Think you know? Okay. All right. Now. All right. I'll keep this right here. How many... I'm going to take some guesses. Don't everybody talk at once, but everybody kind of talk at once. <laughs> How many? 600. 300. Another 1,000? Okay. Okay. Pie. <laughs> Hundred <laughs> never gotten pie. Five hundred. They really are. That's a good question, though. All right, give me um, just a few more. Three thousand. Six twenty-three. Okay. You really mean three? You think there's 3,000 gumballs in there? You're just making that up. What others? Just a few more. Hang on. Let me get to an even number. I do my math better when I do this. That's 13. So I need, let's, let's do two more. 1,200? 1200? Okay. And one last one. 400. All right. Now, if we add these up, there's 15 of these. Do I have my phone? I think I do. You ever get Siri to do this for you? Doesn't do it well. All right. So we got 600. We got 300. We got 450. We've got 200. We've got 1,000. 
we got 900, <sighs> screwed it up. All right, 600 plus 300 plus 450 plus 200 plus 1,000 plus 900 plus 250 plus 1,000. Somebody doing this in their head? That's going to be awesome. Okay, so 15, we're going to cover 97.73 divided by 15 is 651. Now, would you believe it if I told you that there are 665 gumballs in that container? And that at the average of all of your guesses, give us really close to what that was actually in the container. And that happens a lot. This is the law of averages that a lot of people, the same number of people that will go over on their guess will go under on their guess. And which leads me to wisdoms of the crowd. Now, it's funny, when I put this together, this, this was a, an article in 2014 saying, by 2018, crowdsourcing will constitute 20% of all enterprise application testing. A lot of providers out there, I need to keep this updated to see if any of these guys have dropped out, but I think they're still all there. Anybody use crowdsourcing? For, I mean, crowd testing? No? It's a great way to have people all over the world just hack away um, at, your, at, your, at your software. I, I've been a, a tester with, uh, I've done some work with Applause and U-Test, and, and they, they, they give me this thing, so you guys have Krispy Kreme donut here, right? Anybody eat Krispy Kreme donuts? It, aren't they great? I live 30 minutes away from the place where it started. And this is, you don't get to look like this by accident. I eat a lot of their donuts through the years. <laughs> and uh, I, I told a person at the airport, you know, I live right, a, right near down the road from where Krispy Kreme started. And he's like, thank you, sir. Would you like a donut? <laughs> I was like, I don't care. But, but it is true. Um, the reason I say that is U-Test sent me a, a link the other day. It said, would you like to volunteer? to test with one of our clients. The client was Krispy Kreme Donuts. They wanted me to test their app, ordering donuts, driving with the mobile, driving to their location, and then and picking up the donuts, and then they reimburse you for the donuts. What great deal, testing and donuts at the same time. I did it, it worked, and uh, I tested their app and also tested their donuts that week. Talk a little bit about inattentional blindness. We have 15 minutes, and I'll try to be fast. Inattentional blindness, we've already talked about some of this already, but um, conscious perception is the abnormality. Um, it's, it's the same thing as you, you drive home, and you get all the way home, and you don't realize that you missed a lot of things along the way. Uh, it's not associated with any vision defects or deficits. It's just where the uh, individual fails to recognize an unexpected stimulus that is in plain sight. Um, visual stimuli compete for processing resources, and when important information loses out, the consequences can be lethal. We've got situations where, um, an example where we have an automobile driver who's driving, they turn into their uh, driveway and all of a sudden they hear a thud and they've hit someone on a bicycle because they're so focused on driving home and turning in they don't see someone coming out of the way. We've heard situations where uh, medical staff, nurses, doctors uh, don't pay attention and they, and they miss out and they, they look at the label, they put the wrong syringe and, and there's fatal results from some of that where people don't pay attention to what they're doing in, in a situation where it's life-threatening. I don't know if this story, I've sort of read this, but, if, but I don't know if this is, I don't know when this happened or where it happened, but talking about the, the people on the plane noticing a bulb flashing on the control panel and focusing so much on that that the plane crashed while they were trying to figure out why the bulb was flashing, literally uh, due to not knowing what's going on, and, you know, not focusing on, hey, we've got to still fly the plane while we're trying to figure out what's, why this is flashing. How do we cure it? Well, there is no cure. We're going to be like this for the rest of our lives. But we can avoid distractions, minimize your multitasking. Remember that looking is not the same as seeing. 
How many people have kids here? You know that, right? They're looking at you, looking right at you. They're not, they're not seeing you. They're just saying, okay, you're asking me, Daddy, to, to look at you. I'm going to look at you, but I'm thinking of ten other things, but I'm going to play on my iPad ten minutes from now. They're not listening and seeing. They're just looking. Um, eyes open does not mean seeing something. And, and make sure you, you don't fall prey to that. We're going to talk, I want to show you this bistable image. Now, which way is this person spinning? How many people think that this person is spinning this way? So they're on their, they're on their left leg and their right leg is spinning around. And how, yeah, how many see that? Okay. How many people think they're standing on their right leg and their left leg is spinning around? Or maybe they're still standing on their left leg. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, how many of you think she's spinning this way versus that way? Yep, it changes? You guys are really good at seeing the difference. Most people get stuck on that one. Like when I look at it right now, they're kind of, she's turning this way, okay? But if you stare at it long enough, you'll see her go the other way. So it's, all, it's consistent, but somebody come up with a, a thing online where you can do this and you can see. So once you see it this way with the color, there's no way you can see them not turning that way, right? This, this one kind of locks you in. It's the same as that one going the other way. Sometimes you think more detail, you see more detail, you'll see things the right way they should be seen. But this one could go either way. You may have seen anamorphic art. You may have seen it and not known it. It's like, what is this? You know, people standing here, but then when you look at it from the other end, just the, the actual view. Seeing things from the right angle gives you. Yeah. Oh, are they? <laughs> okay. So you guys have seen this for cricket. I just learned cricket this week because it's on TV like 24 hours a day. So I've been watching it for three days. I was an NFL football fan in the USA, and I learned cricket. I went to Wikipedia. So now I feel like I know everything about cricket, and I'm sure I, I'm sure I don't. But I enjoy watching it. Choice blindness. There was a thing on uh, a thing called Brain Games on in the U.S. A, a, a TV show where they took two cards and they, and where they had a stack of cards and they had the people guess which person. They had a guy come up and they said, "Who do you think is the most attractive lady here?" And the, the the guy said, "I think this one is." So he picked number two. So they turned over the cards and then they 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 slid them back and by sleight of hand they replaced the person in number two with with a different lady's picture. For example, the lady may have been blonde hair, no glasses, you know, and, and, and tall, and they replaced it with dark hair, glasses, short, and, and said, and asked this guy, okay, now tell us why you picked this person. So they turned the card back over. He's seeing somebody who he didn't pick, but on the show he's going, well, I picked her because I liked her glasses, and I liked her dark hair. And he, we find ways to convince ourselves that what we're doing is the right thing, even when when we may not have picked the right thing. Does that make sense? Choice blindness, a lot of times, we think that when we're testing that, well, we should have gone that way, and we start convincing ourselves that was the right thing to do. People do this all the time. Um, with, with, with Once you think that's, well, that's what I did, maybe you go to lunch and you come back, and you're like, well, I think that's what I ran. I think that's the test we ran. That's, I think that's what we did, so let's just keep going. And you convince yourself you've done it this way. You fall into that choice blindness. There's a time to dig deep. Sometimes the, it may look good on the outside, but on the inside it's better with, with another situation. <laughs> Example, do you know what this is? Can you tell? Tomatoes. It does look like tomatoes. With some bad spots. Yes. Good job. You've seen this, haven't you? Were you in my last presentation? How about this one? Huh? Tea bags? What about this one? No? Razor? Wow, you're going to get an A in this class today. <laughs> Very well. Okay, I quit. You win. I can't do it anymore. Now, if, if we were a smaller group, I have a puzzle that I give out to folks. And I give everybody a puzzle, a piece of a puzzle. I put you into four groups. And what you get is... Four different bags, every team one through four gets a corner. So it took me forever to put this big giant puzzle together. And the puzzle, I took the corners 
so that you end up getting, team one gets the top left corner, so you get only one corner, and then it's all broken, you know, because now team two gets the bottom right corner, I mean the bottom left corner, if that makes sense. So all four teams have a, a corner. And it's more fun if you actually participate in this and do this, but as I knew I would run out of time here, um, one of the things that I, I use with that is a lot of folks, you have a tester's ego, you know, and you, and you say, I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep doing this even though I can't find four corners because I won't do a puzzle if I can't find the four corners, me. If I can't find four corners and then do all the round, the part around it, then I'm not going to put that puzzle together. I have a lot of people that just struggle and say, oh, you know what, I only got one corner, I'm just going to figure out what to do and I'll start from the corners and work my way to the middle. But a lot of times I said to folks, here's the top left corner, here's the top right corner. And I found a really cool puzzle that each quadrant looked really good by themselves top, bottom left, and then bottom right. But then the problem is nobody looked at the big picture. Now, a few of my classes that I've given on this, somebody will say, hey, look, I think they've got pieces of my puzzle. I think they've got some of the parts that I need. And, and then you see people working together. Don't feel like that you as a tester working in the testing organization, in the development organization, have to only work with just your team. The more you can work integrated with everybody, see the big picture, work with your stakeholders, work with the development team, the test team, with everybody. It does help you along the way to be able to understand what, what you're doing as an organization. I cannot remember everything. I, I stopped focusing so narrowly. I enjoyed this picture. This is near my hometown. Someone posted. Stop. No, no, really, you got to stop. Um, one of the things I thought that was interesting with UI, UX design is when you look at everything that takes place, visual design is at the top here. Now, I don't want you to read all this. If you can read this, you've got really good eyes. But, but it, the, the focus here is about visual design and making sure that, that you have visual design kind of takes, I mean, what I, my, my purpose of saying this is that you find a lot of really good things. I mean, you, you find that visual design kind of caps everything off when you start looking at the product and what you're doing for the, for the client and the stakeholder. Automation, we talk, you know, this automation conference. So I want to mention, um, a lot of times automation can really help you make sure that you don't miss things in visual testing. And, and it's really good in assisting things that the human brain gets really, finds boring and missing. Um, there's tools. I don't work for Apple Tools. There are people here in this room that work for Apple Tools. You can talk to them. I'm not here to promote their, their product, but I, but I, but I have seen, if you, if you take their examples of, um, it, it will quickly show one screen to the other exactly what's going on. Anybody use Apple Tools here? Yeah? Are you familiar with Apple Tools? Anybody familiar with Apple Tools? After this conference, you should really be familiar with Apple Tools. <laughs> I'm skipping through a few things here, validating the content. Visual bugs don't just happen to the small guys. UPS had issues where this is what they had on their screen. Uh, Microsoft had issues where it would go completely off the screen. Uh, Financial Times, we had issues where words were wrapping around. And, and, and tools like Apple Tools and, and visual testing tools can find these things for you when you just don't notice them. They're small changes, small moves in the, in the, in the, the wording on the screen or, or just simple changes they'll, they'll catch. Skipping here. And the way they do it is they take screenshots, they do baseline images, then they map the, the, the differences. I'm giving you a very poor Apple Tools uh, promotion. That's why I'm not here to do that. Talk to Gil in the room here if you want to, and, and these guys with the Apple Tools table. It's a very interesting product. Um, last thing I want to tell you, um, one of the few last things I want to tell you is neuroplasticity, your brain's potential to reorganize by creating neural pathways to adapt. There are people, it's been proven if someone has brain damage and they have an accident, their brain is damaged and it's part of their brain that does motor skills or some type of function in your body, you can actually rebuild that from, um, you can actually rebuild that by exercising your brain and using your brain. And the reason I brought this up is uh, once you start firing new synapses and you start learning a different way, it takes, it takes therapy with folks who have physical brain damage to bring back their skills. I say as testers, 
A lot of times we've got to keep exercising the different things that we might be deficient on in testing and figuring out how that you can build that skill set as well. Primacy and recency. You may not remember the first and the last thing that I talked about, but uh, I mean, and the middle, the thing that I talked about through the middle, but I hope you remembered a lot through through this presentation. But a lot of times we as as, 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 as humans, not even testers, you'll remember things that happen at the very start of a program or start of a, a of any situation, and you'll remember the very end, but it's the middle that you don't, uh, that you that you miss out on, you kind of forget because it becomes mundane. I had a Lego story. If we had another three hours, we'd do some Legos, put some Legos together. I would tell you quickly because I'm running out of time. It, and, and the Lego story was, I took, I took a group of folks, put them in five groups, handed them a package of Legos without any instructions. And these, this Lego set would do these three things. And I made them try to figure out what it was by putting it together. And then I said, would anybody like instructions? You can send one person from your team to come up and look at, look at the product. And I put this one together, the helicopter. And when I did that, they all went back and they started trying to build a helicopter. And then I said, how about instructions? Would anybody like the booklet? And they said, yes, please. So I give Three of the five, a helicopter, which they had already seen. Some, one of the person had seen it. Somebody got the book. I give two of them the plane, and I give one of them, I mean, one of them the plane and one of them the boat. Now, the plane looks kind of similar, so they didn't notice anything, but the boat people got really frustrated. Lots of times the boat people leave my workshop, and it's always fun to watch them leave. I'm kidding. I don't mean that. I don't want you guys to leave. Stay all day. But it's true. The, the boat people quickly figure out because they can see the difference. We don't pay attention. Um, make sure you, you look, look long if you only get one glance. Um, but you can build and test without requirements. That's the one thing we found with that Lego process was you can, um, you, you don't have to have requirements, but it's good to know exactly what you're trying to accomplish, but you don't have to have detailed requirements every time. Uh, you may they'd be able to depend on the leader. One of the things that the Lego thing taught us was the leader didn't always go back and tell them the right things, and they didn't always go back and say a helicopter or an airplane. They did that wrong. And even when you have a good look, sometimes the requirements change, as they saw with getting the, the different changes there. So my last slide is this. Visual testing is critical. We know that. We don't always see when we're looking. There's time, uh, there is a time to look close, and there's a time to step back and see the big picture. And no matter what you do, pay attention, because it will always help you as testers and, and in your organization to do so. And I know we've got, like, literally one minute to test for questions. Okay. So if you have questions, please. Uh, okay, I put someone to sleep. <laughs> I will remember this forever. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> He's had a long day. He had to help me set this up. <laughs> okay. Do we have any questions? Thanks, Mike, for Thanks. such an interesting and engaging workshop. So I'm pretty sure everyone had fun. Uh, do we have any questions? Awesome. One question I have is, how fast do you prepare uh, images for your presentation without picking from internet? <laughs> <laughs> how, how would, what, ask me again, I'm sorry? No, how fast do you make images for your presentation without picking from internet? Um, I will tell you that a lot of my images, there's a really great tool. I'm giving you my secrets now. So anybody that presents, there's a great tool out there called slidebot.io. Um, it's about $150 a year, but you can type in what you're going to put on the slides, and it'll go get the images and build your PowerPoints and give it to you. Um, it's one of the best tools a speaker can use, and, 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 it's, and it's really been helpful for me to have that. Um, this is one of my older slides where I kind of pulled in those images myself. But, um, but with slidebot.io, you get a free trial for a month if anybody wants to try it. It's really cool. And I, I don't work for them either. But it, their product is really cool, and I fell in love with it because it, 
And um, I've used it at work. I've used it in my presentations. It's just a really creative tool. And it does what you can do. You just go Google it, and you could do the work, but it does the work for you. So I like that automated part of it. Hopefully that answered your question. Thank you. Any more? You exhausted? This is your longest session of the week, right? Okay. Okay, then. Thanks, Mike. Thank Go you ahead. so much. Thanks. Thank you.